Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Crown Report. My name is Brittany, and on this program, we discuss some of the major royal news stories of the week. So on this program, we will look at today the latest YouGov poll showing who the most popular royal is, and I will give you one hint. She often wears the Queen Mary's, often known as a Cambridge lover's knot tiara. We also have the King and Queen of Sweden doing some dancing to ABBA. We have the upcoming state visit between the Netherlands and Spain and some details on that that are very exciting already. And we also have some exciting baby news out of Jordan. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into our first story of this week, which is the latest YouGov popularity poll. They do these much more frequently now than they used to. This used to be something they did once every year, once every two years, something like that for the British Royals. And then they've decided to basically do it every couple of months. This really started after Harry and Meghan entered the picture and there was all this kerfluffle with Mexit and everything going on. Then you have the Queen's death. So this became a very popular thing to do. And you actually see this reflected in how they rank their popularity. You see it going up and down much more. And I will show you that in a minute. But the most popular royal, according to the poll right now, is Kate Middleton, also known as the Princess of Wales. And so currently, according to the favorability, she has a positive rating of 76%, a don't know of nine, and a negative of 15. And this is interesting to compare to her husband, Prince William, because he has a positive of 73, but a negative of 21, which is obviously rather high. And there could be a lot of factors going into this, especially with all the things that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have stirred up. But it's always interesting to see in terms of the neutral, because I think neutral is very interesting in these polls because you can push neutral one way or another. If it's a yes or no, people are pretty much set in stone on those issues. Sometimes you have a bit of fluctuation, generally not huge, although we do see that with Harry. And we will get there. But another exciting person is Princess Anne, who remains at 71% positive. And she does sort of all those bread and butter engagements that are not super exciting. But she goes to them and people really appreciate all the work she puts into it. And she currently has a negative rating of 13%, which is the lowest among the British monarchy. And obviously, we're not covering all the working royals because the Duchess of Edinburgh is also a working royal. But her husband's positivity is 54%, but neutral is 24, which is the highest. So this means that people just don't know enough about Edward to really make a concise decision. But because of King Charles undergoing cancer treatments and Catherine as well, and William often being at home with Catherine as she's going through those treatments, we will see more of Edward. So we could definitely see a switch. King Charles is at a pretty solid 63%. Negative is 30, which is, I would say, a little Hi, but what is interesting is that royals compared to politicians, politicians, I think the rating for Congress in terms of positive feelings, at least in the United States, is like in the teens. Politicians would kill for these favorability ratings. So they are very, very good. Camilla currently sits at 50 positive and 41% negative. So it would be better if she could get more people into that neutral territory because, again, she can maybe influence them either way. But the big disappointments probably for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle is that they remain sort of deeply unpopular figures. Harry only has a positive rating of 31%, Meghan 26, and Harry has a negative rating of 61%, Meghan 64%. Obviously, Andrew is the most unpopular royal with a positive rating of just six, negative of 86. But this Harry and Meghan quotient, I think, is definitely very interesting. And we'll go a little further into that here as we go down. But when it comes to the monarchy in general, the royal family at least has a positive rating of 61%. So generally people like the members of the monarchy. Negative is 32. And then the institution of the monarchy in general is at 58% positive and negative is 33%. So those two numbers are very close together, which is both good, I would say, and maybe a little bit bad. So both of these numbers are actually pretty close together, which I would say is both good and bad. It would be nicer to see that royal family and the institution of the monarchy in general be a little bit more positive. But we do have some people bringing down these quotients. And you got to think if Harry and Meghan and Prince Andrew are on this survey. People are thinking of that as they respond to these particular questions. I don't know quite the order that they ask these questions in, but if you bring up Harry and Meghan and Andrew and people are asking, well, what do you think about the royal family in general? And you're including those three people in it. It could definitely skew the results that you're seeing. 
And I would like, again, to see this positive rating of the monarchy go up a little bit because I think the monarchy has misstepped over these last couple of months, especially with everything that's gone on with Catherine. Some of it was utterly and completely social media driven, perhaps even driven by foreign actors, the Sussex squad, so many different things. But there were definitely things that pals could have done on their end to sort of mitigate some of that. I think, unfortunately, the releasing of the picture that was obviously very photoshopped at the end of the day, ended up really giving credence to all the negative rumors that were already existing and just magnified them and it just sort of steamrolled into chaos. And so that is something that perhaps did impact it. And we'll look at the year to date comparison because they do offer that as well. But it's always interesting to see these favorability trackers. Now, again, these used to be done once every couple of years. So you see here with Catherine, this is really steady. And that's because they did it here, 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 and then maybe then down there. So there might've been actually several years in between some of these pollings. But as things have gone on, and I think especially with Harry and Meghan and just all the chaos they've introduced, they've started to do these polls a lot more. So you see a lot more inconsistencies here and a lot more changing of status. And that is because in reflection of things like the Oprah Winfrey interview, Harry's book, Netflix, a lot of that is driven just essentially by Harry and Meghan and what they're doing on the outside, which is not necessarily, I think, great for the monarchy in general, because I think some of that negativity rating could be amended or maybe changed by really making some very clear decisions regarding Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, their role within the family, and perhaps going as far as stripping the titles or those sorts of things. Because Harry and Meghan, every time they use the titles of Duke and Duchess of Sussex, to a certain extent, are representing the monarchy. So let's look at Catherine's here. We see her going kind of up and down. We don't know this exact date, but I would imagine that would be probably around Oprah Winfrey. And we see it go up and down a bit. And here we got Prince William pretty steady, but again, They've had a lot of changes here, and then he's kind of gone up and down. And so he's still a little bit down from where he was. I'm not sure exactly the reason for that. And this poll was taken, I believe, April 3rd and 4th. And so we have Princess Anne. There was a period here where she wasn't tracked, but you could see her definitely going up. And this is just absolutely bizarre because I think they totally just wouldn't track her sometimes. It's going up and down. So we, then we do have Charles here. We go up, up, down. And so he is slowly going up, just had a little bit of a dip. And so we go to Prince Edward. He wasn't really tracked until recently either. And so we've seen, obviously, his popularity go up. And that's probably just because, in part, people are seeing him more and there's more attention on him. We have Queen Camilla, who's definitely dipped very low, but to come up, I would say, pretty even. Here's the most interesting one, though. And that is the Prince Harry one. He used to be one of the most popular royals. Now he's the least popular. I think you could call this a Meghan Markle slump. If you get involved with Meghan Markle, she has sort of a catastrophic impact on your popularity. So when it comes to businesses as Harry and Meghan are looking to do that, obviously they have a tough hill to climb because they are very unpopular still. And then you have Meghan Markle who did start off sort of popular, but you can tell people were not exactly sure. This line could have gone up, but she's created a situation where it just kind of plummets into oblivion. So sometimes she has a little tick up and then tick down again. But when you're looking at a business as Harry and Meghan are doing, this is not a good, necessarily a great look. And obviously, Andrew was never very popular. Now, obviously, off a crater. Now, when it comes to young versus old people, younger people definitely like Harry and Meghan more. And I could see that how they appeal to some of the younger population a bit more. But I would caution Harry and Meghan not to get too attached to that because yes, sometimes you can be flashy and attract some of the younger people, but as time goes on, those people grow up and they may not like you very much anymore. They may come to have a different perspective on you. So that's always something Harry and Meghan should keep in mind. So we see that the last time this poll was done was February 6th and 7th. So we have that right here. And so the question that they were asked is thinking about the royal family for each of the following. Please say whether you have a positive or negative opinion of them. So when we look at the past, Charles has gone down slightly from 66 positive to 63 positive. Camilla is still at 50. William has taken about a four point hit here from 77 to 73 and negative from 16 to 21. For me, at least if I was advising William, I would say that's probably not the greatest news. 
Harry um, remains deeply unpopular. He has a popularity total of 33 in February, dropped now to 31. So he's taking a hit. Negativity is going up 58 to 61. It'd be great to see like over time because I'm sure there's a long time period. You could just see it just crater. So net favorability, negative 25 in February. And now it's negative 30. That's really, really bad. (laughs) The Princess of Wales has seen a net jump from 74 to 76% and negative went up just one point from 14% to 15%. That 1% could be, or one point could be reflective of the whole Photoshop debacle. Megan lost a total positive rate of one between February and April going from 27 to 26. And then her negative score has gone up from 62 to 64. When from a net favorability of negative 35 to negative 38. You, you kind of want that number to go up, not down. So that's not great news for Megan. And so looking at the Royal family in general here, we have a good comparison. So net favorability has actually taken a bit of a hit here. So net favorability in February was 35%. Now it's 29%. So that means that their total positive was 64 and now is down to 61 and negative went from 29 to 32. So again, we're seeing some of these numbers that flip over just in reaction to everything that has gone on, especially in the month of March. And for the institution of the monarchy in general, it's taken a bit of a hit as well. So net favorability is down from 29 to 25. What they do for net favorability is compare the total positive with the total negative. And so we've seen the total positive drop from 60 to 58 and negative go up from 31 to 30. Three. So looking at all these numbers, this is good and bad news for the monarchy because, yes, I would say they still have a very solid favorability there. Obviously, 60, 50 percent is very high compared to especially a lot of politicians. They definitely don't get those numbers. Catherine being the most popular royal is not a surprise. And that is not because she has an illness. It's how she's dealt with the illness, which I think has been in with a lot of grace. And so people are seeing that and responding positively to it. But I think seeing that the net favorability of the monarchy and the Royal family in general, the feelings towards them have dipped a little bit. It's something that the Royal family should take into consideration. Obviously these aren't huge numbers, so no real, real cause for alarm, but you know, a downward slope a little bit can lead to a downward slope a lot. And so all this is how the monarchy deals with the upcoming challenges. And of course, their big ones remain Harry and Meghan and their immense unpopularity and Prince Andrew as well. I've always said I am perfectly fine with Prince Andrew going to Easter services, Christmas services, those public events that are very much family events, not royal engagements. Although sometimes they straddle the line between both. That is perfectly fine for him to attend, but they really do need to figure out what to do with the Andrew and Harry problem because it is a problem because as long as they have those additional titles as Dukes, they still somewhat represent the monarchy in many ways. And they are trying to Oftentimes it seems like play both sides, play Kate, Andrew, play Kate, Harry, while they sort of, especially in the case of Harry, run amok with the title that they've been given. And so I think as the royal family moves forwards, one of the challenges I think so many of them are facing is how to deal with the members of the family that don't really have a working function within the monarchy anymore, because that is happening increasingly throughout Europe, because most of the monarchies are streamlining, downsizing. I think to a certain extent, the UK overreacted and overly streamlined because now they're running into a bit of a problem, which is a youth issue because most of the members are 60 and above. And so that's becoming a bigger challenge, I think, for them, especially with engaging with the younger population. The UK is also much bigger than, let's say, the Netherlands or Sweden or Norway. And so they don't have as much of a land mass or even a population to meet with as much as the UK does. So that definitely changes how different royal families operate and how effectively they can streamline. I think the British family probably went a little bit too far because now they're really stuck in the future with only the whales as kids working. And Harry and Meghan are a huge factor in that as well, because I don't think Charles was anticipating at all Mexit. And because of that, his plans to include Harry and Meghan and potentially their children as well in the broader royal world and giving them greater and greater roles as time has gone on, Harry and Meghan obviously chose not to do that, which is their prerogative to do 100%. 
But it's also left the rest of the family in a lurch in many ways. Obviously, they do not want Harry and Meghan back. I think that's been abundantly clear. But at the same time, they have to deal with a new reality, which is that they have a monarchy that's aging and they need younger members, but they can't really call anybody up right now. I know a lot of people have suggested Lady Louise or Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, but it just doesn't seem like they really want to have a part of that. And I think especially in the case of Lady Louise and James, who are the children of the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, they just will not have a big role. So it just doesn't make a ton of sense to include them in these things. So that is it looking at the favorability. Let me know what you guys think. Should they be looking at Sophie, the Duchess of Edinburgh more? What do you think about Princess Anne? I think it's all very fascinating to see because it's not just about being popular, but it's about how that popularity can help the rest of the monarchy in many instances. That is a huge question that obviously many want to address. All right, so next, a bit of royal news to look at, which I thought was just kind of fun, is that Charles will officially be on the money. Yes, oh yes. Charles has received his first Bank of England notes. And this is only the second time a monarch's face has actually been featured on the notes. Even though they've been around since the 17th century, this is only the second time because Queen Elizabeth reigned for 70 years and they didn't start putting the monarch's face on the currency in terms of the paper currency until about that time. Now, obviously they were on coinage. That has always been a big thing. I actually have, I think a George the third coin that I got in an antique shop outside of Hampton court palace. And that's because I love old coins. And I thought it was kind of cool because George the third is obviously the one who lost America. So I was really excited to find that particular coin, but yes, Royals have always been generally on their currency and Charles is no exception. And so he received these notes. There was a really sweet quote when he had been told, obviously he was only the second monarch to be featured on the paper currency. He said, that is what is so surprising. You would think that it goes back and you would think so, but it doesn't. And for those of you who are interested, this currency will not enter into circulation until June 5th. And it will only be replacing notes that have been retired. So as currency gets used, it gets more damaged. And so at a certain point, obviously, when bank notes get into banks and those sorts of things, they make a decision oftentimes to say, well, this currency has been overly used. Let's get it out of circulation and get something new in. So Charles's notes will only be replacing currency that is already in circulation that is going to be retired. So they will not be fully replacing the currency. I know some people maybe were worried about that. They will not be fully replacing it. Obviously, this is done for reasons not only just to avoid a mass disruption, but also for an environmental or financial impact. Because anytime you have to go in and add a bunch of new currency and get rid of a bunch, that is going to cause a lot of massive disruption. So members of the Bank of England came over there and presented Charles with his new paper currency. And so I think that is very, very exciting news. And so I'm very excited that he got to enjoy that special presentation. So next rails that we are going to talk about are the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh who have really been called on to, to step up into the Royal fold because obviously with Catherine undergoing her cancer treatments, King Charles doing the same. And you also have Prince William being there for Catherine and their children, which is completely understandable. They're relying on the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh a bit more. And one of them was this great event that they recently had at Buckingham Palace, which was the changing of the guards. And it represented the Inte Cordial. So it is an agreement between the French and the English. And it was signed in 1904. So it is 120 years old. It represents this strong relationship. And this changing of the guards. So basically the British and French troops were both there. They swapped roles. And it is the first time that a foreign and non-Commonwealth country has participated in this particular event in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. So the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh got to inspect 32 members of the 1st and 2nd Infantry Regiments of the Guard Republican and 40 Guardsmen from the F Company Scots Guards. And so this seems to reflect the growing relationship between the two countries, the French and the English. And we're also seeing this greater reflection and appreciation, I think, 
for NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So this was founded, obviously, after World War II, and it was a pact in order to save off Russian aggression. And Russia obviously created the Warsaw Pact, which was all the Soviet states. And so because of this, this was this huge tension between these two superpowers. And NATO obviously still exists. The Warsaw Pact officially dissolved, and some of the former Warsaw Pact members are now members of NATO. And so this is a huge very, very critical alliance. And we'll see this obviously in the story I have as well from Norway is that there's, I think, seemingly a greater appreciation for what this alliance means because there are several European countries that I think are very, very scared of the Russian aggression that is going on. We see this particularly in Sweden where they basically told people, hey, you need to start preparing for war. And Sweden has also joined NATO. Sweden has notoriously been neutral for centuries. I actually had a whole bit of section on one of the crown reports I worked on, and then Catherine revealed her cancer diagnosis. So I didn't get that particular section out, but I may go ahead and post it. And if you guys are interested, because I do think these are very critical because I think we forget because I love royals and tiaras. I absolutely do. But royals serve a very official and important function as the heads of state. And oftentimes, because the monarchies have been in existence for longer than the countries have been a republic, that they represent the continuity of history behind every single country they represent. Remember, the British monarchy as we know it today was officially established in 1066 with William the Conqueror. And another important note about this particular engagement, especially between the French and the English, is that obviously William the Conqueror was from France. He was a Norman. And him conquering England really did have a huge impact on the future of the island. And so to represent that here, and there's been obviously a lot of tensions between the English and the French. So to see this common agreement here is wonderful. And I think the growing relationship between all these countries here, I think is absolutely fantastic. And on the topic of Russian aggression and Russian misinformation campaigns, we have a very interesting story that I came across today that I was like, wait, what? So apparently Russian news networks have been reporting that King Charles apparently sold High Grove to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Yes. Yes. So this reflects that the Russian disinformation campaign is just very, very real. They apparently created like an AI video about it. And then we're quoting one of King Charles's former butlers, a man named Grant Harold, to bolster the claims. They claim that he sold Highgrove House to Zelensky for 20 million pounds. And I don't think there was a definitive reason why. But one of the things that could be suggested is that President Vladimir Zelensky, he would use it to sort of escape from the Ukrainian front or something like that, because what we have here is a very obviously a geopolitical conflict between Russia and the rest of Europe. And Russia is definitely capitalizing on the sort of weakness that we're experiencing right now in the British monarchy, particularly that the monarch can't be as much as front and center as he usually is. We obviously have Catherine as well with her recent cancer diagnosis. All these things factor in together to create a perfect environment to sow disinformation and dissent. And we see Russia obviously doing this. They've even reported that King Charles is dead in certain instances. He is very much alive, though. He is very much alive. So this is just something very, very interesting to consider as we go through and look at royals and the role that they have within their various countries. It is, again, very, very important and critical. And sometimes foreign actors who decide, you know what, I really don't like this particular monarch or what the country is doing in this particular situation go, you know what, I think I'm going to try to sow some dissent there and see how we can manipulate the situation. And that is something very wild to see, I feel like, in this day and age, although there is a report that Adolf Hitler once called Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother one of the most frightening women in Europe just because of the power of her soft power. Because royals have this soft diplomatic power. They're not forceful. They can't really cause wars anymore or anything like that. But they have this very soft power, but it's very, very strong and mighty. So this is just, I thought, a really fascinating story to see this week. When it comes to Sweden, they have a very strong love for ABBA. Yes, oh yes, the Swedish singing sensation group, which spawned the movie Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. They are very much beloved in their native Sweden. Very, very much. When I went there for the King's Golden Jubilee in September last year, they had not ABBA, but a group singing ABBA songs because there's a very special connection to His Majesty and the Queen. And so they did have this recent, just basically, they called it a party for ABBA. So it was representing when they won 
Eurovision with their song Waterloo. I don't know why that had to be a whole concert performance with the king and queen in attendance, but I think it's kind of awesome that the Swedes love ABBA so stinking much. So this was from Swedish television. And so I was able to pull some of this and he is recognizing right now their majesties, the king and queen. So you have queen Sylvia right here and King Carl Gustav of Sweden. And he has been king for almost 51 years. And so he celebrated his golden jubilee last year. And so they had this whole concert performance and behind them, I should mention dancing right there is the king's sister, princess Christina. So they were there. And the very special thing about ABBA and the king and queen, which we see in this video is that on the eve of their marriage, because he was actually already king when they got married because his father died tragically in a plane accident. So he inherited the throne from his grandfather. And so when he married Sylvia, she automatically became queen. So on the evening reception of their wedding, she he is here wearing the Konat tiara, looking quite lovely and beautiful. And so they're going up and they're going to hear a concert from, of course, Abba. Yes. Sorry, that was a longer pause than I intended. So they are in some very, I think, old fashioned gowns here, which I think is lovely. And they are singing to her for the first time, Dancing Queen. Yes, the song Dancing Queen was debuted the night before Queen Sylvia became queen. How awesome is that? Such a great story. We can see them here. They're actually singing it. I will not play it for copyright reasons, but they're giving their a live performance to their majesties or their future majesties, as the case may be. And so then they do a lovely deep curtsy. Oh, I love lovely deep curtsies, guys. That always makes me so, so, so happy. And so then, obviously, she was actually singing Dancing Queen, and so they got up and danced. I think especially you can tell Queen Sylvia just absolutely loved this. I think she was just Dancing Queen. I think she just really enjoys the nostalgic of this and just obviously it's a very, very special song to her. And so I thought it was a pretty good rendition. I like the fact that they were dancing. And so I just thought that was just absolutely lovely. And obviously as well, the Swedes, they love ABBA. They really do. And so there we got the king and queen again. I just wanted to, as much as I could focus on them, because I just thought it was so amazing to see them. And they are clapping as the whole concert comes to an end. And so guys, I just thought that was just so amazing. I just, again, absolutely love singing that they sang Dancing Queen to them on the eve of their wedding, I just think is absolutely incredible. And so I just sort of kind of love that. And I love that she's wearing the Conant there, which was very special to his mother, who I believed had already passed away at this point. So a lot of tragedy there in Sweden. And so, but very exciting to see that event. And I just think it's so funny how much they love Dancing Queen. I love it. I love it. Can't, can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of it. King Harold of Norway is still out on sick leave after receiving a pacemaker in March. He had been on a trip for his 87th birthday to Malaysia when he started having health issues. He's had a lot of health issues over, I feel like, the last year or two. I usually feel like every couple of months I hear about him being in the hospital or being having an infection of some sort. So this wasn't necessarily a huge surprise, but obviously a pacemaker is a huge medical intervention. And so he is still recovering from that. He is not expected to return to royal duties until April 20th. This is a Easter picture of the family. So we have King Harold here, his wife, Queen Sonia, his son, Crown Prince Hakan, who is his heir, his wife, Met Marit. And then they have their two children, Princess Ingrid Alexander, who will be the future queen of Norway and her brother, Sir Magnus. And so Norwegian the royal family, if you are not very familiar with them, are sort of known, I feel like, for their very laid back vibe. But while King Harold is out, Crown Prince Hakan obviously is filling his very big shoes. So recently, the Crown Prince welcomed the King's Medal of Merit recipients, and he also visited forces at Rukla camp in Lithuania as part of the NATO Defense Alliance. So again, doing a lot of things connected to NATO. Here he is greeting people. And I sort of love this because a couple of the people wore traditional Norwegian attire, which I think is absolutely lovely. They usually do this for their National Day, which I believe maybe in May. I know Swedish National Day is in June. Norwegian might be in May. So I just love that they have people who are doing the traditional dress. I absolutely love that. I'm really, really hoping to maybe be in Norway next month. Maybe even 
around this time next month, I may be in Norway. I'm really excited. I have never been to Norway. I have been to Sweden. I just saw it was absolutely lovely. And so Norway, it looks great. And there's another trip I'm even considering for later this year for Norway, because it looks like the King's daughter, Martha Louise, who is actually technically older than her brother, but because of how the succession laws worked when the two children were born, the younger son will become king over his sister. But his sister is getting married to a shaman guy who many believe is very sketchy and they are having a big wedding ceremony up in the fjords. And I was thinking this would be a pretty casual laid back affair, but apparently it might actually be white tie and that ball gowns have been requested and that might include tiaras as well. So I'm thinking to myself, I already had a plan to go to London to view Buckingham Palace and the East Rooms, which unfortunately, I think I think the tickets are all sold out already. They went really, really quickly. And so that would be in late August. Her wedding is late August. So I was thinking, ooh, maybe I will do a trip there. But again, I wanted to capitalize and highlight here the closer connection we see with NATO, because this was Buckingham Palace, again, celebrating the 75th anniversary of NATO. And we see all the NATO alliance flags lining the Royal Mall. And you see, obviously, Sweden, which is the newest addition. It is sort of a teal and yellow color. And then you have the United States, United Kingdom. I believe that is Turkey right next to Sweden. And I think they go all in actually alphabetical order. So yeah, because we have Belgium on the other side, Canada. So they go all the way down in alphabetical order. But again, seeing the importance of this alliance and how it's reflected in the various royals, because this Crown Prince of Khan over in Lithuania visiting some of the Norwegian troops, which are part of a basically a NATO attachment. So this concentration and appreciation, graver appreciation for NATO, I think reflects the world that we live in, the world that is perhaps, you know, you could say maybe getting a little more dangerous than it used to be. And so to see him going out and do that, and obviously we've seen a lot of this from other worlds as well, reflects the changing geopolitical situation in Europe and how some of these countries, which have sort of historically been maybe somewhat antagonistic, are all sort of uniting over their concerns about Russia. So again, I think we think Royal is a very fun and frivolous thing. We see think celebrity and those sorts of things, especially here in the United States. But again, there are graver implications and there are things going on with how they represent their country, which could reflect perhaps graver tensions in the future. And so for our fashion segment, because I want to sort of do a fashion segment every time because I love royal fashion. It's one of my favorite things. I do have actually a whole channel devoted to royals, royal fashion news, and we usually do a tiara video once a week. And one of my favorite tiara wearers is, of course, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. She's not wearing a tiara in this particular picture. She's wearing this gorgeous Oscar de la Renta navy dress, which sort of has this these white flower appliques on it that go over one shoulder and down one side. And I just think she parti looks particularly lovely in this outfit. And so the engagement she was at was at a program to help encourage internships for those studying for middle management and and vocational training. So she was at the Amsterdam's stage pack MBO MBO apparently what I could understand stands for middle management and vocational training at capital C. So she was there for that engagement and they are hoping that this event ends up with greater cooperation between the municipalities, schools, and companies to ensure that many people, many Dutch students can get internships that hopefully turn in maybe into careers or give them great job prospects for the future. She also spoke to the life affordable of the national Institute for budget information, NIBUD in media plaza and, so Maxima, if you do not know, is well-versed in finance. She was originally within that field. She was actually on Wall Street for a period of time before meeting and marrying her husband, King Wilhelm Alexander. And we have some a bit of exciting news about that here towards the end, which we'll get back to. And in the other very exciting royal news and something I have been so looking forward to, because one of my favorite things that we see oftentimes is state visits. So these are visits between two countries. Now, Oftentimes, because there's not a ton of monarchies around the world, these states' visits will just feature the royals in their diamonds. And then whoever is visiting their country or if they're visiting another country, they will obviously usually are presidents or those sorts of things. But when you get two royal families doing state visits, oh, it makes my heart happy. So we do have a really, really exciting visit coming up between Spain and the Netherlands. 
And so for those of you who can't see it, so by, at the invitation of His Majesty King Wilhelm Alexander, His Majesty King Philippe VI of Spain will pay a state visit to the Netherlands on Wednesday the 17th and Thursday the 18th of April. King Felipe will be accompanied by his wife, Her Majesty Queen Letizia. And then it goes through and explains the historic relationship between the two countries. And they have maintained diplomatic relationships since 1648. So it goes back quite a long time. And Queen Maxima is actually from Argentina. So she has some, you could argue, Spanish heritage or Latin heritage there. And so we do have a schedule of events. So on Wednesday, the 17th, there will be a welcome ceremony. And with the king and queen, a wreath laying ceremony. There'll be a couple of engagements. And then in the evening, there'll be a state banquet. And what is really exciting about the state banquet, it will be the first time Princess Katharina Amalia, the Princess of Orange, will attend. And so she is their firstborn daughter. She will be the eventual queen of the Netherlands. And so she has attended some functions. She's actually worn tiaras, I want to say at least three or four times now. And so this will be, though, her first state banquet. And I'm so excited for that. And we also have Princess Beatrix of the Netherlands, who is actually the former queen. There's actually a tradition in the Netherlands to abdicate for basically the next in line whenever the monarch feels that the timing is appropriate. It started way back with Queen Wilhelmina, whose mother was Queen Emma. And so Queen Emma actually ruled in her stead for a period of time because she married her husband who was quite old and she was there was like 42 years age difference between the two. So she sort of became the de facto queen while her daughter was growing up and then Wilhelmina became queen. And so she sort of started this tradition and went then to Queen Juliana, Queen Beatrix, and eventually it'll be King Wilhelm Alexander abdicating in favor of his daughter, Princess Catherine Amalia. So this will be her first sort of big step into the royal world in some ways. I mean, she's done a lot of things so far, but again, these, these are sort of big functions. And we also have, it looks like a couple of other on the next day, we have some, a business forum, visits to the States General, m Mental Health and Young People, the Amsterdam Spanish Film Festival, which Queen Maxima and Queen Letizia will attend, which I think is lovely because I, I would love to hear them speak to each other in Spanish. I think that would be absolutely amazing. And so there'll be a lunch. And then at the evening, there'll be a return hospitality. So King Felipe and Queen Letizia will host their hosts at the Amsterdam Museum for Street Art and Graffiti. And the Princess of Orange will also attend the reception again. So another big moment for Princess Katharina Amalia. We also have some exciting news for Katharina Amalia because she has also been awarded the Grand Cross of the Order of Isabella the Catholic. So when royals come and they visit each other, oftentimes they exchange what they call royal orders. So obviously for Queen Elizabeth, the most notable one in the UK is the Order of the Garter. And so oftentimes the monarchs of Europe, when they come and do a state visit, they will be gifted the Order of the Garter that's happened with King Wilhelm Alexander and King Felipe, who both did state visits to the United Kingdom. And so for her first state visit, even though she's hosting, she is getting this particular award. And then because it is the first time that King Felipe and Queen Letizia have visited the Netherlands as king and queen, King Wilhelm Alexander and Queen Maxima have also been gifted a new order. They are now part of the Order of Charles III, which is one of the highest within Spain. So it's higher than the one Catherine Amalia got, which is generally how things work. And then it is also reserved usually for the heads of state, which obviously King Wilhelm Alexander is. So very exciting. I'm so excited to see what particular tiara she might wear. So if you guys are curious who we are looking at here, this is actually a picture that I took when I was at Prince Dog Day in the Netherlands in September last year. And so we have King Wilhelm Alexander here, Queen Maxima, and then their daughter, Princess Catherine Amalia in the purple. So I'm really excited to see what she will wear, especially tiara wise, because the Dutch have an incredible, incredible collection. So I'm so excited to see her at her first state function. And we also had some very exciting royal baby news. Crown Prince Hussein of Jordan and his wife, Princess Rajwa, are expecting their first child due later this summer. And interesting to note that if it is a boy, the child will automatically become probably second in line for the throne in Jordan. It is possible for the throne to pass to a brother, but most likely it'll pass to Crown Prince Hussein's son if that is what they have. But if they have a daughter, she will not be included in the line of succession 
at all. So very interesting and very exciting news for them. So congratulations. They got married in June of last year. So just some other quick royal news on April 9th, the King Charles and Queen Camilla celebrated their 19th wedding anniversary. April 9th is also the anniversary of Prince Philip's death back in 2021. And then April 10th is the 17th birthday of Princess Ariane of the Netherlands. And so she is the youngest of the king and queen's three daughters. And so once she becomes of age, they will essentially have no more children in the home, although she is actually studying abroad right now. So technically they don't I guess, totally have school age children in the home anymore. But it is very exciting because once she turns 18, we will have another royal wearing tiaras, hopefully sometime in the future and doing royal engagements because I always get super excited when we see some new royals and to keep going on the Maxima and Netherlands route because she is one of my all time favorite royals. I do have a bit of a preference here. Let's go ahead and take a brief little look I clipped this together from the full thing of an upcoming television series about Maxima. And what's so exciting is that it's in English, at least partly. And so take a look at this trailer, which is, by the way, all in English. So my father always taught me I had to reach for the highest. To work hard. He's taught me everything. I am who I am because of him. Alexander, Prince of the Netherlands. How did an Argentinian lady end up on Wall Street? That's a long story. Well, I have time. The Príncipe de Verdad. That's it. That's very Do I bow or just do like a little nod? Mama, up. It is Maxima. I can see why he likes you. Okay. And you call this not a big thing? It's not what I'm saying. To hell with politics! Keep your light shining. You want some advice from an old veteran? Stay where you are. Keep your light shining. Keep your light shining. Shining. Oh gosh, guys, I have to say, I am super excited for that. It's coming out April 20th. So in 10 days, obviously we do have Scoop out as well. And Mary and George, which are two other things that you can watch. Scoop is on Netflix and Mary and George, at least in the United States, is on Showtime. And it covers the paramour of King James the first. So anyways, guys, lots of exciting royal news going on. There's just so much to report this week. I hope you guys all really, really enjoyed it. Let me know if you have a favorite segment and hopefully soon we will be adding what I call the red box segments and those will be for members of the channel. So you guys can submit questions or I find questions and I will answer them there. So guys, thank you again for watching and I shall see you soon. Bye.